Dear friends, Allah upheld. I am delighted this morning to be with you at your service and four more session today and tomorrow concentrating on the life and the achievements and the works of Abdulba. This morning the talk was supposed to be given by our dear Mr. Glimford Mitchell who unfortunately couldn't come and the responsibility was given to me to open this conference by looking at the life and the achievements of the beloved master. We of course profoundly feel the sense of deprivation from Mr. Mitchell's remarks and talks and his presentation, but I will try my best to provide you with a general look at the life of Abdul Ba at this first session, and I'm delighted that I will have more opportunities this afternoon and tomorrow to go into more details, particularly on his works and his relationship with the members of his family. And I do hope that in those sessions we will be able to cover more or less the main areas of Abdul Baha's life and his achievements. This year, as was mentioned, is the centenary of the trips of Abdul Baha to the West. September 1910, he left the Holy Land, and December 1913, he returned to that land. So from 1910 all the way to December of next year, 1913, we will be celebrating his journey to the West, and the period is really ripe for all of us to ponder, to think, to meditate, and to get more familiarity with this person, if you are Baha'is, if you are not Baha'is, doesn't matter really, because I believe Abdul Baha, the history will show in the future, that is the most significant man in the 20th century who has impacted the social life, the administrative life, the spiritual life of humanities. We are so close to his ministry that we are unable, utterly unable, to understand what he has achieved. But the history will prove that he is the man of the 20th century, and I do hope that I can touch upon some of the achievements to show you this fact of the matter of his life. For this year that we have 1913 in front of us, I mean 2013 in front of us, until the December, I would like to humbly suggest that you listen to me this morning and this afternoon and tomorrow, but more than anything else is our responsibilities to look at his works and to meditate upon his teachings and talks and what he has left behind as the intellectual heritage of the pen of Abdul Ba. At the same time, I would like to suggest that we reconsider, re-study the fundamental work of the beloved guardian God passes by and the few chapters that the Guardian has devoted in that book on the life of Abdul Ba. This is the year for us to go to those chapters and revisit them. The other point is the studies that have been done, and I would like to start with these materials that are at disposal, and I think the result of this conference would be, hopefully, to go and study these materials that I'm giving you the list of it. Mr. Hassan Balyuzi definitely has written the most extensive book on the life of Abdul Baha. Is 
a few decades old, however, is the best source after the writings of the Guardian, after God passes by, to understand the station and the achievements of Abdul Baha. And for those who know the Persian language, of course, the writing of Muhammad Ali Faizi on the life of Abdul Baha is a major work. And now we are fortunate in the English language that we have Mahmoud's diary and nine years in Akka, and those are wonderful gates towards the understanding of the personality and achievement of Abdul Baha. More than probably anything else, and the shortest one, and the most profound source for all of the Baha'is to understand the station of Abdul Baha is a short chapter that the Guardian has devo devoted to the station of Abdul Baha in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. If you go to the dispensation of Baha'u'llah and the chapter on Abdul Baha in the dispensation, you will find out about the role, the significance, the creativity, and the achievements of Abdul Baha through the pen of his successor, the Guardian. Now, in the past couple of years, we have some new studies. Quite a few sites in the internet for his trips, for his achievements. And those are, of course, available to all of us who work online to get our knowledge and understanding of his life. Dr. Boshui has published a book on the life of Abdul Baha that is available. And recently, about four months ago, Dr. Shapur Rasek has published a new book in the Persian language on the basis of the centenary on the life and the works of Abdul Baha. So these are more or less, basically, more or less convenient sources that are at our disposals. And I would like humbly to suggest to you to go and study these materials. And therefore, if you would like to take a nap now, you know the sources. So <laughs> you don't need to follow me. You don't need to listen to me. Have your nap. And whenever I'm making an important point, I try to wake you up. <laughs> the life of Abdul Baha very conveniently can be divided into two distinct periods. One, I would like to suggest that we look at Abdul Baha from 1844, when he was born, all the way to 1892, when his father passed away. That is the life of Abdul Baha during his, his father. That is significant because basically in those years, and particularly after he accepted Baha'u'llah in, in the Baghdad period, and Baha'u'llah declared to him, and he understood the station of Baha'u'llah, he became under the supervision, under the uh, training, under the uh, educational endeavor of Baha'u'llah to be ready for leading the Baha'i community and to be his successor. I'll go into details when I speak about the writings of Baha'u'llah. Right now, I'm not concerned about that. We do know that during this period of, let's say, early Adrianople, 1863-64, particularly all the way to 1892 when Baha'u'llah passed away, Abdul Baha was responsible for foreign affairs of the household of Baha'u'llah. He was the man in charge of external affairs of the household, dealing with the mayors, dealing with the army personnel, dealing with the government buying lands, renting, being in charge of the pilgrims who would come to the Holy Land, particularly during those 24 years of Baha'u'llah in the Holy Land. And therefore, he rendered a magnificent role in this, in this regard. He was the man in front of the movement. And Baha'u'llah in those years, from the social point of view, from the political point of view, from his social relation, he was behind the scene. Abdul Baha was the man who received the pilgrims, who arranged the meetings with Baha'u'llah, who was the man who dealt with the government, 
and mayors and so on and so forth. And he was responsible for all of those things. At the same time, the most important contribution of Abdul Baha during those years are the materials that he has penned down more or less at the request or I would like to say at the encouragement of, of Baha'u'llah. I will have enough time and if you come to the other session I will have enough time to speak about those writings that he wrote during the time of, of Baha'u'llah at the instruction of Baha'u'llah or at the encouragement of Baha'u'llah and those are very, very significant pieces that he left behind. Abdul Baha was, of course, responsible in those years as one of the eminences, as one of the secretaries of Baha'u'llah. And we have many, many writings of Baha'u'llah that he ascribed. He penned it down. He copied. And therefore, for example, we have the Kitab Aghdas in the handwriting of Abdul Baha, we have the Book of Certitude in the handwriting of Abdul Baha, and we do know that he was involved in copying and rewriting and working closely with Baha'u'llah on the revelation of the writings, and rewriting was the responsibility of Abdul Baha and dispatching the materials. Therefore, this is very significant from the intellectual point of view that from the early days, Abdul Baha was quite familiar with the revelation, with probably every letter that Baha'u'llah penned down, he was familiar, he studied it, he copied it, he transcribed it, and he was in charge of the, you might call it, he was, he was in charge of the secretariat of, of Baha'u'llah. He was a chief or the uh, boss or the head of the secretariat department of Baha'u'llah in the, in the present uh, terms. Then 1892 was a very difficult, very sad year for Abdul Baha. He missed, of course, his father and he took over the responsibility of the leadership of the Baha'i community for 29 years until the 28th of November 1921 when he passed away. There is no time for me to go to all the details. I'm looking at this clock. I'm supposed to talk about 45 minutes. This is 3153. Anyhow, the <laughs> chairman will, will let me know when my time is up. During those years, 1892 onwards, very fast and in a summary form, I would like to point out to a few great achievements that he made. One of the most important, the most significant achievement of Abdul Baha in those years was his, I'm terribly sorry, I get emotional. I'm ready to cry. Was to make the necessary arrangement for the remains of the Bab. The remains of the Bab and Muhammad Ali Unu Anis was for about 50 years, half a century, going from one place to another in different cities in Iran, including Tehran and Qom and Isfahan. And then finally in 1899, the remains reached the Holy Land. It was the beginning of a great joy. It was the beginning of a great trouble for Abdul Baha. And for 10 years until 1909, he was basically dealing with the remains. He had a very clear instruction from Baha'u'llah 
Baha'u'llah in 1891, he went to Haifa, he went to Mount Carmel, he sat down on the place that the burial of the Bab should have been, should, should take place. He pointed to the land, and that was one of the greatest achievements and greatest responsibility of Abdul Baha in those years to purchase the land and prepare the foundation and make the rooms. And this took him about 10 years, 1899, all the way to Nowruz, the new year of 1909, and finally this was achieved. Now for the Baha'is and for the non-Baha'is, for everybody who goes to the Holy Land, to Israel, you see the result of that endeavor. The temple of the Bab is raised in the Mount Carmel, and what that was one of the greatest and the most challenging project of the early decade of the century for Abdul Baha to get it buried. Then, during those years of the opening decade of the century, one of the most important historical, social, and religious development in the history of the Baha'i faith took place. And that started in this land in Chicago around the mid of 1894, 95, when the name of Baha'u'llah was raised and reference to his achievement and his mission was mentioned in the conference in Chicago. And as a result of that, Thornton Chase accepted the Baha'i faith. And during those four or five years, many Baha'is, in fact, in the United States accepted the faith. And it's convenient to remember that by 1900 onwards, we have now the new waves of the Baha'is from the Western Hemisphere going to visit Abdul Baha and to be with him in the old city of Akko. This is one of the greatest, again, greatest achievements and greatest uh, event is a turning point in the history of the Baha'i faith when we have the Western believers accepting the faith and going to the Holy Land to visit with the Master. This was so great in two ways. Abdul Baha found land of hearts of these believers to cultivate the seeds of the new revelation in the hearts of these people. At the same time, it was a great opportunity for Abdul Baha to understand the intellectual, religious attitude of the Western believers. All the way from 1844 to 1900, we have, of course, Jews from Hamadan and Kashan, and Zoroastrians from Yaz, from, from Kerman, and from Tehran, and the Shi'is, of course, and some of the Sunnis who accepted the faith and were coming to see Abdul Baha and to see Baha'u'llah and so on. But from 1900 onwards, now we have the Jews and the Christians from the Western Hemisphere, from European and American cities, going to the Holy Land. And this was a turning point in the history of the faith. It gave a new universality to the faith, and it brought new potentialities, capabilities to the faith of Abdul Baha. And he was responsible for raising these people, teaching these people, sitting with these people, answering their questions, and particularly dealing with the Old Testament and the New Testament and introducing to them a religion, a religious system, however rooted in the Oriental religious system, to these Western minds who came to, to visit him. So you see that this, from the intellectual religious point of view, is a very important development in the history of the Baha'i faith. During the first 10 years of 
Abdul Baha again, something happened which is very, very important for all of us, and we are still feeling the uh, results of that endeavor. Towards the end of the life of Baha'u'llah, let's say very conveniently, 1890, about 1890, a new Baha'i community was established in Ishqabad. And within a few years, the number of the Baha'is in that land reached to about five, six, seven hundred Baha'is who went from Yazd and from Sabzavar and from other cities of Khorasan to Ishqabad and they built the Baha'i community of Ishqabad. And the community was so prosperous and due to the endeavors, energy, financial support and encouragement of the Afnan families particularly, we owe them a great deal in this particular regard, there was a decision to build the Mashogol Askar in that land. And that dates back to 1902, when this enterprise became a central project in the mind of Abdul Baha. And a lot of consultation meeting with the Afnans, bringing Us Ali Akbar Yazdi Banna to the Holy Land, working on the construction of the first Mashogol Askar. And from 1902 all the way to 1917 and 18, when the Mashogol Askar of Ishqabad was inaugurated, was opened, and the ceremony was held, almost for two decades of the early decades of the 20th century, Abdul Baha was dealing with this question of Baha'i Temple in that city. And finally, the Mashogol Askar of Ishqabad was built. And friends, the literature that we have on this mighty spiritual institution, Mashogol Askar, the literature that we have about that mighty spiritual institution of Mashogol Askar, probably 98% of it has to do with the writings of Abdul Baha. The question of building the Mashogol Askar, of course, is in the writings of, of, of Baha'u'llah, in the, in the Kitab Aqdas, 1873. But its actualization of this idea, this concept of Baha'i Temple, materialized in 1902 when they wanted to really build and materialize this, this concept of Mashogol Askar. And the Mashogol Askar was finally established in that land, brought a great deal of joy and happiness, and it was a very forceful source of spirituality and social activity and educational activity and intellectual activity and a teaching institution in that land, and it brought a great deal of respect for the Baha'i community of Ishqabad. And as a result of this Mashogol Askar, the fate of Baha'u'llah went all the way to Samarkand and Bukhara and Dushanbe and towards the north to Moscow and St. Petersburg. And as a result of that activities and the expression of the Mashogol Askar and the attitude of the Russian government and so on, one of the greatest man of literature in those years became interested in the Baha'i faith, and that was Tolstoy. And the father of Amin Jazab, who passed away just two weeks ago in Phoenix, went and visited Tolstoy. Then it continued when Abdul Baha came to this land, and in 1912, he laid down the cornerstone of the Mashogol Asghar of of Vilmet. And then the question of Mashal Askar became a very central point in the writings of the Guardian later on. And in all the plans that he wrote and prepared for the Baha'i community, buying land, building Mashal Askar, 
establishing financial assistance for Mashaul Askar, even in Tehran, were envisaged by the Guardian. And now this movement is getting momentum again. Chilean temple will be built, and you have read the message of the House of Justice regarding the more national and local Mashaul Askar, which is one of the major characteristics of the informative age of the sixth epoch and probably goes all the way to the end of this epoch of the Baha'i faith in the coming years. One of the things that we owe Abdul Baha, oh, probably now it's working. It says 19. It means that 19 minutes I have or 19 minutes I have spoken. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, we are, we are not concerned about time. We have a powerful chairman. He will grab me and bring me down from the stage. I'm a very light and a small speaker, so. Usually the chairman do not have any problem with me. And I'm a Yazdi, so I'm full of fear. <laughs> Embodiment of. Really, we don't know how much efforts and energy were spent during the time of Baha'u'llah on the administration of the Baha'i faith. This is not very clear, at least to me, or probably other students of the Baha'i writings at this point. But definitely, towards the end of the century, Let's say around 1898-99, one of the most important development is happening under the eyes, under the supervision, under the guidance of Abdul Baha, and that is the institutions of the local spiritual assemblies. And this man, the master Abdul Baha, was responsible to bring the teaching of Baha'u'llah about the local spiritual assemblies, which was establishing the Kitab Aqdas into maturation, into materialization. And therefore, the earliest local spiritual assemblies that we have, and particularly started in Tehran, was done by Abdul Baha under the direction of Abdul Baha. And from now, from this point, all the way to the end of his life, we have tremendous amount of literature on the importance of the local spiritual assembly, the importance of the role of the members of the spiritual assembly, the importance of the spiritual value of this institution, and more than anything else, the importance of consultation in the communal life of the Baha'is. So the local spiritual assembly is the center for guidance, is the center for protection, is the center for the spirituality of the communities, is the center into which all the Baha'is regarding anything that they have in their life, they have to turn and go to the spiritual assemblies. A spiritual assembly, not the governing body, but a father of the community, the protector of the community the educator of the community. And when we look at the writings of Abdul Baha regarding the spiritual assembly, you see how he has put together the question of government, administration, and spirituality, and education in one institution. And this is really amazing for the creativity of this mind. And when he also speaks about the question of the Mashaul Askar, the Baha'i Temple, and the attachments to the Mashaul Askar. One of the greatest achievements of Abdul Baha, are you getting tired? You're, you're sick and tired, yes? <laughs> none, of, none of the above, okay. 
Thank you so much. I needed you to be seated in the front of me. So, the other institution that took place during the time of Abdul Baha, and we have to remember and appreciate his works and his writings in the institution of Dar Sakhla, moral educational system of the Baha'is. Friends, we are talking about these issues and going, but we owe a great deal of respect and appreciation to Mirza Hassan Mutawajjeh. And we owe a great deal to Abdul Baha for guiding Mutawajjeh or Mirza Hassan how to conduct the moral classes of the Baha'i children, which happened during the time of Abdul Baha. And we know now that the spiritual education of our children is the solution to the human problems, to the problem of ethics and morality. And morality and ethics are not qualifications that you can introduce to an adult. It should come from the breast and the, from the milk of the mother and it should be built in the life of the Baha'i communities that the child be raised spiritual, dignified, understanding the human value, and working on it, and developing those values. We are not supposed to be the recipient of these energies, but we are supposed to be energizing this spirituality, and this is the function of Baha'i Dars Akhlaq, Baha'i educational classes. This was materialized under the direct supervision of Abdul Baha, and we have tremendous amount of writings that he wrote to the uh, education committees and educationers and trainers and the teachers of these institutions, and good many of these excerpts have been published in the compilation of the Universal Laws of Justice on Baha'i education. Another important development that happened during the time of Abdul Baha, and I would like to mention, is the expansion, or probably the establishment of the Baha'i publishing houses. Friends, all the way during to the end of the life of Baha'u'llah, we have just a few books of Baha'u'llah published in a primitive form, but Baha'u'llah never saw his works in print. I mean, not all of the revelation was he was able to publish it. There are some publications of his writings which dates back towards the 1891, 1890, 91, 92, when he passed away. But this great movement of the publications of the Baha'i writings got momentum during the ministry of Abdul Baha. I don't want to go into the history of the publication of the Baha'i books, but this master, this beloved master, was responsible for dealing with the Baha'i writings and getting them published in Cairo for the first time. Also in Haifa, also in India, and also in Iran. And probably the most important one was in Turkestan in Eshkabad, when the Baha'i community was flourishing, and it was all the possibilities at the disposal of the Baha'is to publish the Baha'i writings. So this is, again, a great achievement, and we owe a great deal to Mohyeddin Sabri, to Farajullah Zaki, and these, and to the Afran families responsible for the Baha'i publications in Bombay, who started the publication of the Baha'i writings. Another achievement of Abdul Baha in those years, which I have written about it in Encyclopedia Iranica, and recently Soli Shahwar published Forgotten Schools is the Baha'i Schools. 
Again, this is one of the achievements of Abdul Baha, that during his ministry, he was able to establish the Baha'i schools. And God knows how valuable, how important, how influential were these institutions, humble ones, with difficulties, with restrictions materially, with the lack of possibilities a great deal, but we had devoted teachers who understood very well the importance of education. Putting the material education next to the spiritual education. And that is the name of the Tarbiyat school, and Ta'id school, and Tawakkul school. And you cannot believe that hundreds of schools were built, were established by Baha'i women in the villages. That is throughout 1900 all the way. If, yeah. I've, I've, I've written at the request of Professor Yarshater, the article on Baha'i schools is, is in the encyclopedia. You have all the details and all the sources. And now we see that this concept of Baha'i school and Baha'i courses and teaching the Baha'i faith in the universities is getting momentum during our time. But my point is that the seed, the initial aspect of this activity is started during the time of Abdul Baha. Now I come to another question, which is very, very important, particularly is relevant to the conference and to these years. And that is the coming of Abdul Baha to this land. The Guardian very clearly says in his God Passes By, that we cannot understand the impact of this three years trip of Abdul Baha to the West. There is no way to measure the importance. But the fact of the matter is that when Abdul Baha came to this land, barehanded, but with dignity, without expectation, with absolute humility, and with the love for serving mankind, he captured the spirit and the mind of thousands of people around him who had the privilege of seeing him, listening to him, visiting him in numerous occasions that he went from New York all the way to Los Angeles. Those years, those months in fact, that Abdul Baha used in in the United States and Europe are the most, I think, the most fruitful years of the life of Abdul Baha. In those years, he was able to go to the most distinguished universities of the time to see the great, a great deal, a great number of scholars, politicians, ambassadors, people of capacity in Europe and also in the United States. He met with Gebran Khalil Gebran, Tagur, Professor Chine of Oxford University, Vambury from Bukharest University, E.G. Brown when he was in London, and he was and of course, Taghizadeh and Muhammad Abdu and Sheikh Muhammad Bakhid and uh, do, those are in, in Egypt and, and Beirut. He was able to convey to them the need for change in the spiritual philosophy of human life. This is his point. He is saying that you in the West do not have any problem with material wealth. 
The source of the problem is the lack of spiritual understanding of the human station on this planet. Work on that. Be kind to the colors. Be kind to the poor. Teach your students spiritual values as well as science and technology and modernity and so on and so forth. That was his cry, and that was the main theme of many, many of his lectures that he gave. In those years, Europe is engaged with nationalism. I hope I can have enough time to speak about the situation of Europe in those years. That how and in which climate, political, social, intellectual climate he's talking about that. It's fascinating. Nobody listened, or many people probably listened, but they, don't, they didn't believe in him. They didn't take it to their heart. They didn't take necessary action. And as a result of that, as soon as in December of 1913, he went back to Europe, uh, he went back to the Holy Land. We have the July of 1914, and that is the beginning of the First World War. And we have more than 20 million people killed. And more than 80 million people were affected by the results of this First World War. One of the fascinating aspects of his trip into the United States which shows his personality is his visit to Inglewood Cemetery when he went and kissed the grave of Thornton Chase. For him, Thornton Chase was everything. He was the beginning of this spiritual movement in this land. And he has spent time and energy to go to Inglewood and visit him. And I think that was the highlight of Abdul Baha's visit to the West. Of course, in addition to the putting of the cornerstone of the Vilma Temple, and so on and so forth. Abdul Baha's other achievements is the encouragement of Baha'i scholarship. Friends, again, this is a very important topic. And the result of his endeavor in this particular regard is the creation of Mirza Abul Fazl, a giant in the intellectual history of the Baha'i faith. And the result of his encouragement and his love for a scholarship was the creation of Fazel Mazandar, who penned down more than 10,000 pages on the history and the teachings of the faith. And forever and ever, we are indebted to Abdul Baha for raising this generation of Baha'i scholars with the profound understanding of the significance of the revelation, its history, its background, and the fact that the promises and prophecies 
are fulfilled in this revelation. Then as a result of that, and the continuation of this trend, we have Ishraq Habari and Dawoodi and tens of others who came to this line, I think as a result of the momentum that Abdul Baha created in Mirza Abul Fazl. Now I would like to look at the achievement, one of the achievements of Abdul Baha for giving us Horas Holi. We are not concentrating on Abul Fazl, Abul Fazl Mazandarani, but when we come to the West, Colby Ives, William Sears, the Maxwells, Horace Holy, and the Downs are very, very, very important in the role that they played in the intellectual work of the faith and in the expansion of the faith. As a result of Abdul Baha's coming to the West, we have the declaration of Marie, the Queen of Victoria. The, the Queen of Romania. That was not materialized during the time of Abdul Baha himself, but she was familiar with the Baha'i faith through the talks of Abdul Baha and she accepted the faith. And it brought a great deal of joy and happiness to the life of the guardian when she accepted the Baha'i faith and became a member of the Baha'i community. And probably more than anything else, we owe the master for Martha Root, who accepted the faith, the greatest teacher that we have had, the greatest servant that we have had. And these are the people that Abdul Baha trained them, nourished them in the West or in the East. And all of these individuals really changed the face of the Baha'i activities around the world. Suffice to say that the Dons were responsible for going to Australia. And whatever has happened in Australia for the past several decades has to do with the activities and the opening of the field to the faith by these people. Thank you so much. I wanted to make sure you weren't thirsty. Okay, thank you. So, you're not concerned about time? Oh, I'm concerned about time. But I kiss you to let me finish. I enjoyed it on behalf of everybody. <laughs> Friends, the chairman, his own responsibility. I respect the time. It's finished. I basically tried to give you some of the major achievements and the contributions that Abdul Baha made to our faith during the ministry of 20 years of 1892 all the way to the end of November 1921. The most important, most important than all of those things that I have mentioned to you is the writings that he penned down during those years. Starting from 1864, going all the way to around the 20th of November of 1921, about 10 days before his passing, which sums up to more than 28,000 of tablets, books, and treatises that he penned down during those years. I'll be with you this afternoon, tomorrow, to concentrate on the writings of Abdul Ba, which I think is left for eternity and is going to be the source of inspiration for the generations and the generations of the humankind who come into being.
Thank you so much for your patience.